Hey friends, um, I have been watching and enjoying uh, the various contributions uh, online as we've been trying to entertain each other during this ridiculous, long, stay at home, no end in sight uh, uh, period. One of the strangest things we've all ever lived through. And, um, and I've, I've been so grateful that, uh, that we've all been making these various videos to keep each other amused. Um, and I wanted to make my own contribution to that. So what I've decided to do is take us through um, my book, Letters from Backstage, The Adventures of a Touring Stage Actor, because I want to remember what it was like to travel, to be able to get out of the house and go to other places. Um, this book is a chronicle of my time on the road with two Broadway tours. And it came about in sort of an unusual way because I... Uh, it was such a big deal when I got my first Broadway tour that I wanted to take all my friends with me. So I wrote these short stories about every stop, about um, not just what the city was like, but, but what was going on in the show and, and the various things that went wrong during the show and just, just our various adventures. Um, and I would send out these emails and people started sending them to their friends. And before I knew it, I had this readership. And, uh, and that, that's, what's in, that's what's in the book. So it's, um, it's, it's, it's written to friends. And um, I hope that you will, you will do me the honor of considering yourself one. Um, today, I'm going to give you uh, the, uh, the dedication, the preface, and the very short first chapter. Uh, and then we'll get into the, next time we'll get into the real, the real meat of things. Um, this is the dedication. Um, and this is, you know, this is going to be long form watching or listening, so it, it may not be for everybody. But, you know, if you're sitting home doing a puzzle, you can put me on instead of a podcast and I'll, I'll take you around the country. You know, if you like. Um, throughout my life, in the best of times and the worst of times, when I was weird and crazy, and when I was wise and strong, and when I was broke, and when I was rolling in dough, the people who have been with me consistently have been theater people. They've been my friends, lovers, teachers, counselors, confidants, sisters and brothers, mothers and fathers, and lots of crazy cousins. In all ways, my true family. It was theater people who valued me, encouraged me, told me when my work needed work, straightened me out when I was being an ass, ribbed me when I got too serious, and always did so with tolerance and support, always with my best interest at heart. And often, they seemed to feel I was perfectly great just the way I um, imagined that. Theater people are, as a rule, crazy. Of course we are. The world needs crazy people to make art. And I've come to love and embrace my adopted family for that very quality. God bless us, we're all bananas. And so this book is dedicated to theater people everywhere, the folks who put it on and the folks who come to watch it. I thank God that we found each other. To have lived and worked among you has been exactly what I wanted from my life. That's true. Prologue. Prologue or how I got that job. When the world-famous musical Les Miserables came to Broadway from its successful run in Europe, the creators realized that they needed to make a few changes for the U.S. production. Most significantly, they decided to add a prologue. You see, in France... Audiences were already familiar with the story because virtually everyone had read the book. From what I hear, it's not unusual for a French baby's first words to be Mama, Papa, Wine, Brie, and Victor Hugo. They already knew that Jean Valjean, the hero of the piece, is arrested for stealing a loaf of bread, serves 19 years in prison, and then is released a bitter convict into the cruel world of 19th century France. They knew by heart the part of the story where a kindly, devout bishop gives Valjean the silver he tried to steal and charges him to use the money to become an honest man, thereby utterly changing the direction of Jean's life. So originally, the musical picked up the story at a much later point after all that stuff had already happened. But on the whole, American audiences aren't quite as familiar with the great classic novel, so for our benefit, they tacked on a prologue, which barrels through all of the foregoing, allowing us to feel as savvy and as well-read as any French baby. And thank God, because without it, we'd all be lost. Similarly, as I prepare to welcome a whole new group of readers and share what was once a series of personal letters to friends, I've decided, after the fact, to briefly race you through the journey that led to this particular adventure. This way, when they produce Letters from Backstage the Musical, you can be the snooty, well-read ones. 
I was one of those kids who grew up dreaming of being in a Broadway show. And when I got old enough, I began to pursue that dream. Everyone's path is different. In my case, I had some personal hurdles to jump before I could present myself confidently, and I never booked a professional paying stage acting job until I was 30 years old. Then again, I've always been a late bloomer. As an aspiring actor in New York, I basically never worked. Well, that's not true. I worked. I worked at Houlihan's, Dallas Barbecue, Fandango Bistro, Curtain Up, Miss Grimble's Cafe, Marvin's Place, where the owner told me not to be so friendly and to cut the limes smaller because they were expensive. And very briefly, at Coconut Grill, an establishment from which I was fired because I got too hyper when things got busy. Strange but true, I liked waiting tables. It was a social job. People were out to enjoy themselves, so I encountered them at a time when they were more likely to be in a good mood, though not always. And in New York, waiters talk back to their customers. They're expected to have personalities. And that gave me a chance to subtly practice the dialects and behavioral traits of my patrons, which always seem to add up to better tips. People like people who remind them of themselves. But more than that, I liked waiting tables because it has for decades, if not centuries, been the official support job of the aspiring professional actor. With my first recitation of the nightly specials, I felt I had officially joined a sacred order. Balancing plates was a rite of passage. Now, finally, I thought, I'm a real actor. As fulfilling as all that was, Believe it or not, I aspired to more. I hope to eventually become the other kind of actor, the actor who gets acting work. So as an experiment, I moved to Los Angeles for six months, and that was 14 years ago, and though it appears I'm still here, I insist, I'm just visiting. I am forever and always a New Yorker. And by the way, that's why I'm back here, because... It was never home. All right. Um, L.A. turned out to be a good move. Over the years, I managed to build a solid career in television and regional theater. Eventually, I was able to give up my day job, as they say, and make a living in the arts, something I never imagined possible. So I stayed. And my childhood dream of being in a big Broadway show became one of those things you just let go of as you get older and more realistic about life. It was okay. I was a working actor, and that was more than enough. In our business, working at all is in itself an accomplishment. My chosen profession has caused me to do some very strange things, like walk into a nearly empty room where two or three people sit behind a bare table, hand music to a pianist, stand on a little X and sing, and then leave. It's the kind of thing that sounds incredibly silly if you stop and think about it, so we don't. And yet, I've carried out that bizarre sequence over and over again. It's how a musical theater actor gets a job. It was a very long time before I could audition like this without coming across like a nervous, raving idiot. Now I actually enjoy it. I happen to be blessed with a wonderful, dedicated, passionate stage agent. Eric loves the theater as much as he loves making deals for his actors. I had only recently started working with him when he phoned one day, and he began the conversation with a phrase that I've come to learn is Eric's puckish way of letting you know he has something tasty to report. Now, here's something interesting, he began. They want to see you for the national tour of the producers. You need to fly to New York. They're sending you right to callbacks. You'll be singing for Mel Brooks and the director, Susan Stroman. They're considering you for the lead role, Max Bialystok, the Nathan Lane role. Thud. I looked at the phone as if it were broken. You're joking. How did this happen? I'm your agent. That's how. And so I began to prepare for this audition, carefully studying the huge packet of scenes and songs I'd received in the mail, and I started to get nervous. It's a normal reaction. So I, I pulled myself aside for a little chat. Okay, Michael, listen to me, I said. There is no point in getting nervous, and here's why. You are not going to get this job. There are too many talented New York stage actors with Broadway credits. It's not going to happen, so just let it go. But the one thing is guaranteed. The legendary Mel Brooks and the celebrated Susan Stroman are both going to take three minutes from their busy lives to watch you sing a funny song in an audition studio on Broadway. Now, if you're nervous, you're going to miss out on one of the coolest moments of your life. Don't do that to yourself. Go enjoy it. Be in the room. Relish it. 
And this became my mantra. It calmed me right down. I wasn't going to New York to get a job. I was going there to enjoy the wildly unexpected honor of singing for two entertainment legends, and who knows, maybe even making them laugh. I was so successful in that mental preparation that weeks later as I stood there singing, I remember thinking, wow, this is really cool. I hadn't planned on a second audition. So when they asked me to come back the next day, I, I had to rearrange my return flight. I, I was thrilled. Apparently I hadn't stunk up the room. I'd get to sing a funny song for these folks again. The next day, 47 people sat behind the table where Brooks, Stroman, and a few associates had sat the day before. There was tension in the room, and I've learned over time that it falls to me to break that tension. As I walked to the little X in the center of the floor and prepared to sing, two of Miss Stroman's associates got up from the table and headed for the door. I don't know what it is, I said. Whenever it's announced I'm going to be singing, people put on their coats and leave. Everyone laughed gratefully. Mel Brooks fell out of his chair. I can now die happy. After I sang my song, they had me read several scenes and put me through some simple dance moves. At moments like this, you try not to notice how well things are going, but the fact is this much attention is usually a good sign. Finally, they said thank you, which is auditionese for we're done now. And I went home and I returned to my life. A month later, Eric called to say, now here's something interesting. They wanna see you again. Again? Yes. They're flying you to New York on their dime and putting you up at the hotel pseudonym. A uh, little sidebar. When I was preparing this for publication, I had a way too um, anxious lawyer who made me change the names of things. This is about the Paramount Hotel. I don't know why I had to change it, but anyway. The pseudonym, I said, that's a swanky place. What is it these people think I can do for them? The upscale hotel pseudonym, <laughs> I love calling it that, uh, was staffed entirely by sneering, sexy people in black. I'm pretty sure they send them for some sort of resentment training before allowing them to deal with the public. Catering to the less than famous wasn't, well, paramount. The, the lobby was trendy and candlelit, and none of the doors had identifying placards. You just had to know which one was the business center and which one was the broom closet. Each elevator was lit with a different color. I liked the orange one best because I could almost make out the numbers on the buttons. Everything was dark and stark and hip and imposing. My room was microscopic. The room service menu, two sheets of white paper, typed and stapled, gave no further description than... Omelet, bread, chicken sandwich. Everything said, we're really far too interesting to care that you're here. This wasn't doing much for my nerves. Why couldn't the producers have been stingy and put me up at a friggin' Motel 6? I went to a nearby cheap, friendly, well-lit coffee shop for dinner and tried to unintimidate myself. The next morning, I returned to the now familiar audition studio. This time, they really put me through the paces. I gave a whole concert, and they had me read a handful of scenes, not only Max's, but other characters as well. And then they thanked me again, and you know what that means, so off I went. Just outside the door, the nerves that I had successfully kept at bay broke through, and I was breathing hard and shaking when the casting director came into the hall to stop me. Michael, oh no, now what? I have to ask you something. Yes, sure, anything, what? I said, what could possibly be left? I sang, I danced, I made Mel Brooks laugh. What's next? Now look, Michael, I know that you've done television, and I know that you're very successful. Yes, <laughs> I said with a totally straight face. Now look, he continued, we don't know what we're doing with the lead role yet, and we have to consider all our options, so I just have to ask you. Yes, I said, casually leaning against the wall to steady myself. We have these character roles in the show and you'd be understudying the lead role of Max in a big way. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, is this man pitching the producers to me? He says, I just want to ask you, would you consider that or would you only accept the lead? Well, my brain spun like a Rolodex. For half a second, I, I weighed the option of being very cool and telling him I'd have to think about it, but I just couldn't. The moment was too much of a milestone. Here's my answer, I said. I do work a lot in television, but in my heart, I'm a theater guy. 
and it would be my dream come true to do any role that you'd like to offer me in the producers. We had a moment of true connection. He looked into my eyes and he smiled. He said, that's a really good answer. And I think he loved the theater too. Well, that's what you can tell everyone in that room, I said, because it's the truth. And I flew home again. The next morning I called Eric to say I thought I could have done better and, and maybe he should tell them that. And he laughed. I'm not gonna call them and tell, you, tell them you didn't think you were very good. A half hour later, he called me back. By the way, what are you doing for lunch? Oh, I, I already have plans. Oh, that's too bad. Why? Because you got it. And there was silence. My voice dropped two octaves. What? And this wonderful agent sniffled. He said, you did it, baby. You booked the producers. I'm so proud of you. You start on, and he launched into the details. To me, it sounded like Charlie Brown's teacher. Wah, 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 wah. Eric, I said, I'm sorry, can you go back? I'm not hearing any of this. Can you go back to the other part? You mean the part where I tell you that you've been cast in the first national tour of the producers? That part? I smiled. That's the part. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure I heard it. Can you tell me the rest later? Because nothing else is coming through. The months that followed are a blur now, but I know I sublet my apartment, bought a new suitcase, and told all my friends. I also had a prior commitment to do a funny thing happen on the way to the forum in Utah, which would close conveniently about a week before rehearsals would start for the producers, giving me time to get settled in New York and with any luck compose myself. At the moment, composing myself seemed like a pretty unrealistic goal. I was on the ceiling. And that's how it all started. It's not exactly Victor Hugo, but then he never balanced four plates on his arm, so there. Happy reading, Kostroff. I'm gonna slip in chapter one because it's short. And, uh, yeah. Chapter one, Je suis arrivé, give or take. July 15th, 2002. Hello, friends. Well, I'm here. Yesterday, I bid farewell to Ogden, Utah, having closed my fourth production of A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum, and hello to New York City, my hometown, where in just over a week, I'll start rehearsals for the first national tour of the producers. Well, to be more accurate, I said hello to a city called West New York, New Jersey, which I never knew existed. My home for the next two weeks is my friend Stephanie's place, just a stone's throw away from midtown Manhattan, with a view of the skyline to plots from. After that, I move into the city itself where Jeff and Chris, two guys I don't even know, have generously invited me to stay for the rest of the rehearsal period simply by virtue of a mutual friendship. It's outrageously kind of them. I love my city and I've really missed it. Hardly slept last night. I just sat there looking at it across the water like a photo of a lover. There's something about your hometown, wherever it is. It just smells right. The water tastes right. The sounds at night, in this case, air conditioners, groaning bus brakes, and screaming ambulances are comforting. They're what you remember night sounds to be. So here I am, in kind of this goofy limbo, right on the brink of something I dreamed of all my life, knowing it's starting in just over a week, but not yet. Not yet. Totally loopy from lack of sleep. Only a couple of hours last night and the night before I helped strike the set in Utah until 3 a.m., so I'm shot and idiotically happy. Hard to believe I'm home, nearly, and about to begin what will surely be an extraordinary next chapter of my life. This week's agenda is as follows. I've been asked by the producer's stage manager whether I could possibly make time to see the Broadway show. Well, sure, it's a terrible burden attending Broadway's biggest hit in decades, but hey, I'm a team player. It's sold out, of course, but as a cast member, can you stand it? I get to knock on the stage door, tell them I'm with the national tour, and watch from the steps that lead to the balcony. Forget it, I'm beside myself. To me, that's better than any seat in the house. It's so good, it's ridiculous. So that's Tuesday. On Wednesday, I take the train, if you please, a very theatrical mode of transportation, to Baltimore, well, where I'll be shooting an episode of The Wire, an HBO series on which I have a recurring role as a horrible shark of an attorney who defends drug dealers. Really great show and a terrific role. Then on Friday, it's back here where I'll see old friends wander the city and try to pull myself together for the first rehearsal the following Monday. That's when the real adventure begins. For now, I'm in limbo. 
in a city that's not quite New York and barely New Jersey, just waiting. The anticipation is electric. Still, I hope I can relax and get enough sleep sometime between now and then. I can't show up to meet Susan Stroman and Mel Brooks with bags under my eyes. Sit tight for updates. Kostroff. Next time we really get into it, <laughs> as we read Broadway Boot Camp, which is chapter two. Um, thanks for joining me. I hope you've enjoyed this. Um, that's it. I'll see you for chapter two. <laughs>